Howdy! This is going to be a video of formation evaluation in Carbonix, the basics of it. The outline of this presentation is going to be, uh, first I will give a brief introduction of carbonate reservoirs, then I will mention the general characteristics of carbonates. After that, I'm going to mention some uh, differences between carbonate and siliciclastic rocks. Subsequently, um, I'm going to explain the carbonate classification and diagenesis process. Then um, I will explain the petrophysical evaluation in carbonates. And finally, uh, we're going to discuss a case study on carbonate uh, heterogeneity. So let's begin. Um, carbonate reservoirs constitute approximately 60% of the world's oil reserves, with a large portion located in the Middle East. Carbonate rocks can serve as hydrocarbon reservoir rocks, particularly if their porosity has been enhanced through the solution. On this figure here, we can observe the distribution of carbonate rocks. The prolific carbonate oil basins are here shown in pink, that you can see here in the pointer. Hence, uh, we can acknowledge a vast distribution of these carbonate basins. So now um, I'm going to explain a little bit about the basics of carbonate rocks. So carbonates are sedimentary rocks uh, formed by layers of carbonate sediment deposited by marine organisms such as corals. The typical carbonate rock is made of grains, matrix, and cement. Grains are either skeletal fragments of small organisms or particles uh, precipitated from calcium-rich water. Matrix, on the other hand, is the lithified mode, uh, mud of deposition that fills most of the space not occupied by grains. And finally, cement uh, describes crystalline material that forms in most of the space remaining between grains and matrix. Carbonates can display two types of porosity, primary, primary and secondary. Primary is the porosity developed by the original sedimentation process by which the rock was created. Secondary uh, porosity is created by processes other than primary sedimentation and compactation of the sediments such as fracturing. Most of the uh, useful porosity in carbonate reservoirs is secondary porosity, which is formed after deposition. Now we will mention some differences between carbonate and siliciclastic rocks. First, siliciclastic rocks are formed by sediments that are transported, deposited, and lithified into solid rock. On the other hand, Carbonate rocks develop from biogenic sediments formed by biological activity, where fragments have undergone much less transport. Carbonate rocks are predominantly sandstones and shales that contain a wide variety of minerals and particles. Contrarily, um, carbonate rocks display a more limited group of minerals, predominantly calcite and dolomite. Moreover, uh, both of them present different classification systems. For siliciclastic rocks, the classification system is mainly uh, related to grain composition and size. And for carbonates, the classification system depends on factors such as the positional texture, grain or pore types, rock fabric, or uh, diagenesis. In siliciclastic rocks, the diagenesis normally does not involve a change in mineralogy. However, uh, the diagenesis in carbonate rocks can significantly modify pore space, mineralogy, and permeability. Finally, pores in clastic rocks are predominantly between the grains, and for carbonates, a far wider range of grains are observed. One important aspect of carbonates is the complexity and relationship between grains and matrix. Doham classified carbonates based on the internal structure and textures of the rock. So first we have mudstone, uh, which consists mainly of matrix. Waxstone, which is also a matrix supported, uh, but has 
uh, way more grains. Paxton, that is mostly grain supported. Grainston, which includes um, less matrix and more grains. Poundston are where the original material of carbonates were provided during the deposition. And finally, crystalline, uh, where the depositional texture is not recognizable. One important aspect is uh, carbonate diagenesis. Um, so carbonate diagenesis can be divided into five mechanisms, uh, basically uh, compactation, degradation, carbonate aggradation, stylolytization, and fracturing. Compaction uh, is basically the reduction of pore spaces due to overburden load. Degradation is the destruction of carbonate material through chemical dissolution. Carbonate aggradation is the construction of carbonate material uh, through precipitation and recrystallization. Estylolytization, which is just the, the formation of stylolites. And finally, uh, fracturing, which is basically the fracturing of the rock. Now let's begin with the petrophysical evaluation. The petrophysical evaluation of carbonates can be extremely challenging due to the heterogeneity and anisotropy aspect that most carbonates display. They are characterized by having um, a strong digenesis and poor system. According to Akbar, there are two ways to determine petrophysical parameters from log data. The first one is um, calibrate the parameter to log data, and the second one is just by a direct measurement of the pore space from well logs. So now I'm going to discuss the first approach, which is the petrophysical parameter log data calibration. Um, this is usually obtained using measurements in the field or laboratory where the parameter is going to be estimated using these measurements and log data. Um, it's important to notice that the calibration can be performed in one or multiple wells. For instance, here on this figure, uh, we can observe a facious uh, interpretation using a statistical calibration between the log data and petrologic analysis from cores. Moreover, uh, we can use techniques uh, such as neural networks to improve the calibration between them. Here on, on the figure is the core description and this is the log uh, phases, which uh, apparently corresponds very well. And the other approach is direct measurement of the pore space. Um, on this approach, we're going to use well log information to estimate petrophysical parameters such as saturation and permeability. For example, the FMI, or full hole formation microimager, can provide us a direct image of the pore space near the borehole wall and the rocks that make it up. And this can be a key factor to estimate the porosity in the formation. Here in the image, we can observe possible fractures, where the dark areas here can be interpreted as pore spaces. The FMI can also be used to estimate the connectivity of the pore spaces, which at the same time can be used to predict the productivity of oil. On this plot here, uh, we can recognize that there is a relationship between the oil production and the FMI connectivity. Therefore, it can be used to predict um, the oil productivity. Okay. Now, I'm going to explain one important technique called NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. So basically what happens is that sharp magnetic pulses are used to momentarily reorient um, hydrogen molecules away from the natural magnetic field. So after each pulse, the hydrogen molecules realign themselves uh, with the natural uh, magnetic field, how you see here in the figure. And observing this decay permits measuring the relaxation of molecules, basically the moment when they realign to the natural field, and how many of them relax. So the measurement of how many hydrogen molecules relax provides a measure 
of porosity or at least an estimation of porosity. And the relaxation times indicates the size of pores containing the hydrogen molecules. The relaxation time are usually short for uh, small pore sizes and longer for large pores. So here in this figure, uh, we can observe first the decay um, from NMR uh, measurements here, uh, then uh, the T2 spectrum, uh, where we can recognize uh, a bimodal distribution here. And finally, uh, the interpretation of NMR in terms of the pore size, where we can acknowledge uh, two pores geometries. Another important tool is the DSI imager that gives a direct estimation of permeability. This is determined using Stoneley waves. So what happens is that they propagate up and down the borehole and measures the energy state around the borehole. This relation comes with the fact that in permeable formations, uh, the waves attenuate where a slow velocity response is observed. Here on the right side, we can notice um, the well log tracks of core permeability and the permeability estimation using uh, Stoneley velocity, where we can notice that there is a good correlation between both of them. So it seems that this permeability index uh, works very good. Now I'm going to explain a formation evaluation of a heterogeneous carbonate study. This is a study performed in an oil field in Abu Dhabi from the Shueva Formation. Scientists and engineers integrated geological data, open hole data, and production net data in order to obtain a more accurate model and understand the impact of different carbonate rocks. The Shueva Formation can be distinguished by the reservoir rocks' small-scale heterogeneities. Four distinct reservoir phases have been estimated using lithophages analysis, wireline log data, core porosity and permeability data, capillary pressure and pore size distribution measurements, and finally production data. Moreover, it ranges from non productive reservoir rocks to those with 30% of porosity and 20 Darcy permeability. Therefore, it's a uh, formation that has a lot of potential. These different reservoir rock types observing cores and logs have been correlated in a core of wells. These correlations allows a more accurate permeability estimation in those wells that don't really have core data. Furthermore, they integrated conventional well logs such as gamma ray, neutron, and density with high resolution dimeter and image logs in order to reduce the uncertainty in the model. Here on the figure, we can recognize the integration of core and well log data in order to predict and obtain a more accurate uh, permeability model. Finally, uh, they use borehole images to map uh, primary and secondary porosity, uh, the wellbore azimuthal porosity spectrum reveal an extreme porosity and permeability heterogeneity. Here on the left, we have a figure on the FMI applied in order to obtain the primary and secondary porosity. Their main discovery um, is related to the fact that a low permeability reservoir rock type um, affected the flow behavior. With this information, the operator uh, optimize the well performance uh, despite the lateral reservoir heterogeneity that is characterized in the field, where this, at the end, had an impact on the production, obtaining a stable production of thousands of barrels per day. Thus, carbonate reservoirs can be distinguished to display a complex structure and high susceptibility. Nevertheless, the increase of new technologies and improvement of techniques has helped to characterize in a more accurate and proper way the carbonate rocks. Thank you, these are the references used for this presentation.